everybody. Uh, welcome to, to this part. I'm not sure I haven't uh, rendered these out yet, so I'm not sure which part it is. Well, welcome to the next part. And today's my birthday! Oh my god! It's November 7th. November 7th is my birthday. This is my last year as a warm-up human, uh, meaning that I'm, I've just turned 39 t uh, today. So that means that, um, life, my opinion, life starts at... Um, life starts at 40 so I've had a good 39 years of warm-up this is my last year of warm-up and then the real the real living starts right so uh, let's move forward with this painting there's a few things I want to do with this uh, the first is you know I, I was working very loosely so there's certain things I definitely want to fix or refine um, I also want to uh, add a few little uh, story elements to this piece and the whole idea behind this was to make a I was thinking about this um, uh, timekeeper Right. Uh, if you've ever seen The Matrix, there's this kind of like this is this this the, the the key master type of thing, the guy who cuts all the keys. Well, I always like the idea of the timekeeper, the guy who who runs this big clock. Right. The whole centerpiece of this entire painting. So I want to bring in that kind of a character into this piece without him overpowering the scene. I don't want to take away from the grandeur of this scene, but I want to. Bring in some, bring the the humanoid quote unquote element into the scene and add that extra bit of narrative and personalize it a little bit more. Because as it is right now, it's just kind of a a very loose uh, environment painting, right? So I want to push that concept a little bit further. So let me flat. I'm going to keep these buggers here on another layer. There's my color adjustments. Actually, not screw it. I'll just flatten it. So. I'm just going to do a little bit of refining here because there's a few things here that are just kind of getting on my nerves. Um, but I'm keeping my brush stroke still very loose, very fast. I want to keep that energy of the brush stroke. I want to. I'm deliberately making it look really roughed up and uh, and edgy and and dirty. You know, I want to make it look really dirty and 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 slapped in there. You know, the whole idea behind. I, the, I try to, whenever it comes to narrative or style or whatever the case might be, I like to paint the way it feels to be in this particular situation or paint the way this character feels, right? I'm not, uh, this is a real, um, this is a real work um, and practice in experimentation, you know? I'm, I'm, throwing myself a curveball and trying something different. And I find this is very often one of the best ways to grow artistically, right? This little kind of like peninsula thing I've been doing. Like, or peninsula, it's not the right term. Kind of like cliff thing sticking out. It's kind of bugging me. This whole structure is kind of just... You know, sometimes you got to tighten up just a little bit because there's certain details that just don't seem to work. You know, they're just kind of being a little bit too loose and crazy with it. And it's not really making a whole lot of sense. And adding a little bit of structure can go a long way sometimes. Just a little bit. It doesn't mean you have to throw it in everywhere. But just to add that little bit of structure to say, you know, that this is a real place. It's not just a bunch of random brush strokes. But you keep your main attention, your main focus and detail in that area of focus. And this is very much how concept artistry works. When you're, design when you're concepting anything for a, for a game or for a film or anything like that, um, when it comes to concept work, I described that in my, I think in my Sapphire Statuette tutorial a long time ago, um, that you, uh, it's important to make the distinction between what concept artwork actually is. The word concept art, kind of gets thrown around a lot. It's kind of become the the kind of a generic term to mean digital painter or all these things. And in fact, to be a concept artist is a very specific thing in the in the industry. You know, it's not just you're not just an artist, although it's a lot of people call it that. Even studios call it that way sometimes. You know, but um, one of the things that I very often encourage people to do is something I do myself regularly is um, I read the job description. <laughs> yeah, I know that sounds kind of like, uh, well, we all hope you're reading the job description before you post something. No, because very often they'll say like looking for a concept artist and employers often, you know, very often it's the HR department that take care of posting these things on behalf of the studio. And um, they really don't understand the process or what's what. They don't, don't necessarily understand the specifics 
unless they consult with the director or some some of the artists in the team. And you know, you know how many times I've checked out job postings and uh, they're looking. They say they're looking for a concept artist or an environment artist, and then you look and it's they're looking for a 3D modeler or they're looking for somebody who does ZBrush or you know what I mean? Or they're saying they're looking for a concept artist. In fact, they're looking for a designer. There's there's the distinction isn't always there, so it's important to um, check out that stuff and make sure, try to figure out exactly what it is they're looking for. And sometimes even, I mean, not all the time, but it can happen that sometimes the fact that a studio doesn't know, doesn't necessarily understand the difference between one type of artist's work or another can tell you a little bit about the studio too. You know, how heavily involved they are with artists and stuff like that, because that does make a difference when it comes to your work. If you're working for a studio and they're saying we're looking for an illustrator when in fact they're looking for a web designer you know probably tells you that they don't work with artists very much and probably don't understand how you know it that can that kind of lack of knowledge of the artistic process can also reflect in salaries it can reflect in you know how artists are regarded how understanding they are about the artistic process you know their patience I mean, you'll have no, you have no idea how many clients I've had that didn't necessarily understand the whole process and sometimes weren't even willing to learn, you know. They're just like, you know, I expect you to do it in this amount of time. You know, I expect you to do a 40-page book in three days and I expect you to get paid. <laughs> I expect to pay you uh, a ridiculously horrible amount of money for it and that to, that to me is kind of like, uh, well, thank you, sir. You know, or ma'am. You know, thank you. Have a good day. Unfortunately, I have other stuff to do. You know, you gotta look out for that. You gotta look out for yourself. Remember, you do have a living to make here. You know. It's actually come to think of it, it makes me think about you know a lot of artists out there, a lot of professional artists that you see that put out YouTube videos or professionals or or more beginners. You know, anybody who's got the who's got a little bit of a little bit of courage to put themselves out there. Um, you got to show these guys some respect, you know, because for, for any artist to put themselves out there, rec it's even me painting for you, you know, even me doing this painting for you. I know, I know that I'm being watched. I know my artwork's being watched. I know, you know, I'm conscious of that stuff. Otherwise I'd be kind of brain dead. Right. But when you, when there's an artist that goes very often, the online community can be a little cruel. And I remember there was a, a video I saw of this kid who had put out young guy you could tell you could tell by the sound of his voice he was probably you know 13 or something like that or he was he was a a young kid and he uh, he'd put out some youtube videos of himself drawing like that and stuff and i thought you know for his age for starters being a dad of three i know what 13 year olds are generally capable of pulling off artistically and it was pretty bloody impressive i'm sitting there going man if this kid keeps practicing he's going to be drawing circles around the pros you know he's going to be if he keeps doing that man he's got a good future ahead of him but then I read, read some of the posts and they're like, you suck, you know what, don't waste my time with your stupid videos. I'm sitting there going, dang, man, seriously? This is a kid. Don't, 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 <clears throat> don't trash this kid's dreams when he's not even, he hasn't even gotten a, he hasn't even really given it a start yet, you know? The fact that he's willing and capable of doing that is a sign that this kid's got the balls it takes to, to be a professional, you know? He's not, he's willing to put himself out there and all that stuff, so, you know? I left a comment. In this, in the, in the, in the kids' videos, saying, you know, this kid knows what he's doing, and this is coming from a professional. So, S T F U. Yeah, I didn't say that, but I figured there's probably other kids listening. You know what I'm saying? Just adding a few little details and stuff like that. It's funny. I'm better at detailing when I'm talking in a video because I'm kind of half concentrated, and that's actually kind of cool. It's actually kind of a good practice. You know, even if you don't want to post your videos on YouTube or make them public and stuff like that, actually just recording your painting process and narrating what you're doing actually help. It does two things. It helps you think and it puts you into a bit of a med meditative state. You'll notice probably when I'm creating and more conscious about what I'm working on, I might get a little quieter because I, my brain's kind of going into creation mode. So it requires a little bit more, uh, requires a little bit more juice to, to pull it off. But when I'm just detailing and stuff like this, it's, um, I can really, it's more meditative, so I can just kind of chill out. And while I'm talking, I'm, 
it's forcing me to half think about my work. Um, kind of my brain is sharing sh sharing the workload between talking and painting, and that's actually good because it keeps you it keeps you loose. It keeps you uh, it keeps you from getting too caught up in your work and caught up in fine details. And you just kind of noodle around. And noodling is a good thing sometimes. It's not always a bad thing. This a lot of this painting is a lot of noodling, you know, as you can tell, just by the way I've been painting it. But yeah, you know, if somebody, you got to realize, man, you got to imagine yourself putting yourself out there and making a video, you know, even, and I'm not just talking about, I'm not just talking about kids. I'm talking about professionals too. Okay. Like I'll give you a very good example. Um, I know some artists that are some of the, some of the most uh, renowned artists in the industry right now. I'm not going to name names because I don't want to single anybody out, but this actually applies to a lot of artists, you know, um, that you know out there, people that have a have a good name for themselves out in the industry. The amount of hate that these guys get, you know, is disturbing. And it's, 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 I think people kind of regard when you see, when you see an artist and uh, you see somebody who's making a good name for themselves, you assume that they're stronger emotionally than they are. That's why, why do you think celebrities get picked on so much? You know, they get, really really picked on a lot and you know just because somebody is a great artist or so or really made a great name for themselves or whatever the case might be does not mean that they're designed to handle shit from people you know these are real people man these people with hearts and souls these are people with you know that that you know have good days have bad days and uh you know and and they're putting themselves out there to help out the community and to get their name out there, you know, so people, you know, so that people get to know them and stuff. And some people just take this as, oh, you're a big hotshot celebrity. This means I can start trash talking you and stuff. And I'm like, just because this guy is well known does not mean that you can just start ragging on him, you know. And I'm sticking up not just for the, I'm not just sticking up for the for the the little guys. I'm sticking up for the big guys too because the big guys get. A lot of hate out there you know and I'm not cool with that stuff it's like if somebody's gonna go out and put out some videos for you a okay they're doing it for free okay they're going out and doing this stuff for free to help you you know they're, they're going out and providing you with a lot of excellent information whether it's something you can use in your work or not they're going out of their way to give you some to give you to entertain you to offer you some some demonstrations on painting videos to help inspire you you know, it's not a me, me, me thing. To, to, when I produce videos for you guys, I'm not doing it to to say, hey, look how great I am. I'm doing it because I love to share stuff. I'm doing it because, you know, to me, one of my greatest inspirations um, being an artist was, and something I still do to this day constantly, is to watch and listen to the videos of other artists, you know. And when an artist, an when any artist will go out there and put out a video, that's what I'm listening to when I'm sitting around painting, when I'm not, of course, recording my own stuff. That guy that guy or girl has given me um, some background inspiration or some, you know, very hands-on inspiration and a little bit of company while I'm painting. And that's a gift. And the only the only possible feeling I can have about that is great to be grateful you know and whether whether I'm like super hyped up about the painting that they produced or not is totally irrelevant to me I'm just happy that that there's something new to watch there's something new to inspire me you know that's that's how I feel about that you know but uh, you know it's you gotta just because you know it's kind of the uh, the expectation bias you know there's a guy I listen to uh, he does a lot of um, uh, video game and, and real life RPG uh, uh, tabletop RPG uh, commentaries and stuff and tutorials and stuff his name's Riker and I've actually found out he's from here in Montreal funny enough um, but um, he puts out a lot of videos and stuff like that and he I partially lost my trail of thought here Totally lost my trail of thought, actually, because I started to concentrate, and then I was talking about Riker. Why was I talking about Riker? Totally forgot. 
hopefully it'll come back to me. That's what you get for going off on a tangent all the time. Sometimes that tangent gets away with you. Know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think the bottom line is just be grateful for the gift that people give you, you know? And, oh, that's what I was going to say. Uh, Riker was talking, I was, I mentioned uh, biases, different types of biases, and he was, he was actually describing these different types of biases in, in, in context of video games, right? And the expectation bias is, <clears throat> well, if everybody else does it, then it must be true. It must be the way things are. And because people expect certain things to turn out a certain way, they have a tendency to uh, believe that something is actually the way it is. Like if you expect a certain, and he was talking about the game, a video game, right? He's talking about if this NPC, if this uh, non-player character in a video game uh, did something for me and you get confirmation of it, you know, or if somebody keeps telling you, oh, if you do this, it's going to happen. If you do this, it's going to happen. You hear that from enough people, then you start to believe it actually is true when in fact it's complete nonsense, right? And because, you know, when if you put that in the context of the online community and artists that are putting themselves out for you, um, so, oh, well, the online community, it's, you've heard it for years, it's, it's full of trolls. It's where people go to troll, you know, troll, la, 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 la. You know, that's, people troll, you're always going to get your jerks, it's normal. It's not normal. It's cruel. <laughs> There's nothing normal about trolling. Trolling is cruelty. It is verbal abuse, and that's all it is. There's, there's, no matter what, how you try to candy coat it and make it sound like something nice and make it sound like something common and, oh, 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 silly old trolls. It's not silly, man, because some of these people really hurt other people's feelings, and some people really go out of their way to make other people hurt, you know? And that shit, to me, just ain't cool. Uh, so, you know what I mean? So, you gotta, you know, don't... If you're the type of person who... If you're the type of person who feels like... Uh, you know, well, everybody else is doing it. So if I if I say a bit of shit towards some well-known artist, it's like, yeah, how much damage can I cause to this person? Because you know they have 1,600 fans, and one guy doesn't like their work, then that just means they're a pussy. You know, no, it doesn't mean they're a pussy. It means that they don't like it when you say mean things to them. You know, and you got to ask yourself, do these people really deserve it? Oh, this guy's conceited. Oh, this guy thinks he's a god. You know, that's that's bullshit. You know, that's bullshit. And you know what? Even if somebody, let's say if you were to take any celebrity you can think of in the art community or, you know, in the, you know, in the entertainment industry or anything like that. Yeah, some of them do have a bit of an ego about them, you know, and some of them are actually assholes. But make the distinction, you know, if somebody's a real jerk, you know, like that whole thing that happened with, you know, uh, with uh, Chris Brown and stuff like that, you know, whether it's true or not that he actually abused his, his girlfriend, you know, then hate on him. He's, he's smacking girls around, hate on him. That's cool. You know, let him know that that kind of shit doesn't stand, especially if you're a guy, you know, if anybody's going to stop abuses, stop, you know, men beating up women, it's going to be men who have to take care of that job first. I really believe that. But like, you know, if you get some kind of celebrity and you oh, they think they're so special, they think they're so great and they do everything in their power to just take them down, you know, just some loser in their in their living room that's just sitting there watching videos and sending shitty messages towards people you know these are human beings man just because they're celebrities doesn't mean they're 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 made of onyx they're made of flesh and bone like everybody else so you know you should just because somebody has six thousand fans or six million fans does not mean that your praise or your respect for their work or the fact that you treat them respectably because they're hard-working professionals and they earned it isn't valid you know it doesn't mean that you know well what's the point of saying i love their work if like if they if you go on their facebook page and they've got like seven thousand likes make it seven thousand and one man if you feel a certain way then you express it and don't don't get caught up in the masses you know to me people who base their behavior on everybody else's behavior are actually the ones who are acting like pawns, you know? Well, you know, if everybody else does it, then then I'm irrelevant. You're not irrelevant. If you think you're irrelevant, then, then you're wrong. You're extremely important and your opinion's important, even if 
600 other people have done the same thing, or 6 million other people have done the same thing, right? It's about the community. It's about the world, you know? The reason why a lot of people feel insignificant is because they think in order to be validated as a professional or to be considered popular um, is dependent on the number of likes you have on Facebook. I'll tell you something, Facebook likes are completely pointless. They don't mean a thing. They don't mean a thing. You know? <laughs> I can I, I can work on a painting that you know I've seen for my own work. You know I, I can you know I've had paintings that I've spent like weeks on and I'm super hyped and stoked to show off to people. I can't wait to hear what people feel about it and get reaction from people and stuff. And I got like two likes. Like seriously, that's all I get for all that freaking work. You know that's how I used to feel. You know. It's like, wow, why, and I, you know, you can go on and say, like, why bother painting anything if, if it's going to, uh, you know, you get that, yay, that one little quiet cheer in the back of the classroom, you know, type of thing. You know, yay, good work. You know, and then the rest, of, then you just hear crickets. And then I have other ones where I, you know, you know, I'll, I'll do some five-minute sketch and I'll post it up and it gets like 50 likes. And I'm like, Jesus, what did I do? You know, what, what I, I, it actually would irritate me. Now I'm like, I don't give a crap, you know. <laughs> I post stuff because I want to share with you. I post stuff because it's fun, you know, because I enjoy, I enjoy the experience of, of, you know, you know, of just getting a conversation going with my work, you know, whether it's about my work or not, it's just to get a whole art talk going on, you know, having people come back and ask questions on my forum and say, you know, how'd you do this or what, how'd you do that? And, you know, and, and then see other people jump in and answer the posts by other people. And I'm sitting there going, shit, I'm actually creating a, a, a hub for people to hang out and talk. And I'm sitting there going, that this is cool. This is really cool. You know, uh, I know that like there's a lot of artists out there that have done the same thing that I really uh, that I really respected and, and in many ways inspired my own forum. You know, like, uh, you know, like uh, Matt Core, for instance, who started Control Pain. He just started that as kind of a little side project. With of course an awesome gift for presentation. That guy's know how, knows how to package a website. Jesus Murphy, God, he's good at that stuff. Young guy too. You know, you listen to his voice and you're looking, you're, th you're listening, and you're thinking, oh, he's probably in his late 30s, early 40s. You know, he's freaking. I saw a video of him. He looks like he's in his 20s, and I'm sitting going, dude, seriously, you pulled that off in your 20s? <laughs> I was like. Damn, this guy's got a future ahead of him, you know? I was, like, really, I was super stoked to see that he's, he's still a young guy. He's still, you know, all that experience bottled up into this young guy. Or maybe he just looks young. I don't know. He sure, he, sure, he sure doesn't sound young. He's got a very good a very good recording voice. He's got an awesome recording voice, you know? So he, he sounds like, you know, he's got a, he's, he sounds very pro, which really lends itself nicely to his sight. But not only that, but he decided... At a certain point, he said, screw it. You know, instead of just making this a side project, he decided to make it his full-time job because he was just creating such an awesome community for, for learning. Probably, in my opinion, one of the most fleshed out and, you know, just well-organized communities for artists on out there. You know, and it's 99% of the stuff he posts out there is free stuff, you know. I mean, he really, really goes out of his way to produce a lot of quality content and I'm like dang man you know it's really cool and what did I do you know when I saw that he had this this great forum that I did I you know sit there and sulk in my in my studio and say uh, he's a young guy and look at how well he's doing and I suck let's send him some hate mail <laughs> you know no man I wrote him a personal email right to him and I said dude I love what you're doing keep doing it you know, I really love what you're doing and that's it I didn't call him up because they said oh I love what you're doing uh, you know could you plug me on your site? No, I didn't do that. I, I wrote him authentically to say, dude, you're awesome. I love what you do. Keep doing it. Because he was. I mean, if it wasn't for him and his desire to share stuff with people, you wouldn't have control pain. It wouldn't exist in your life. I mean, think about that. That's pretty cool. You know, that's a lot, a hell of a lot of hard work. If you look at, just look at the size and the content on his site, you know, that's a hell of a lot of work just to share. You know, and it's probably the, you know, for, especially for beginners, he's very good at teaching of starting people off because that can be really challenging. Sometimes it's easier to teach more advanced artists, 
you know, because they understand the principles already and all that stuff, you know. But to teach people from scratch and get them to understand those fundamentals, you know, get them into the right headspace of, um, get them into that right headspace of, uh, of just understanding what the whole principles of the whole principle of art is, is a pr pretty hefty endeavor, and he handles it very nicely. Because he's, you know, he's he's very well spoken. He knows how to break things down into fundamentals really nicely. So, you know, I have absolutely no qualms about, you know, going out of way on my channel to promote the guy, because he's 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 earned it. You know what I mean? And I'm definitely this is definitely a very, you know, a very blatant promotion of his work. And he probably will never even know I'm doing it, but you know what I mean? He earned it. And that's just because you, you know, when it comes to the art community, whether it be professionals, you know, who, who have huge followings, who get, you know, 6.9 thousand likes, you know, or 23,000 likes on a post, or, you know, have get tons and tons of followers in different social media and stuff like that, you keep showing them the love, you keep pushing them, you keep promoting them, because they're doing this for you, you know, and if you just... If you're just a douchebag and give them a hard time, then they'll just stop and you'll lose that resource and it'll be your fault. I-M-O. Why am I ranting? I don't... You know why I'm ranting? I don't know why I'm ranting. I have no idea. My friend Kelly, one of my best friends growing up, she, uh... Her father's... Her father's an author. And, uh... A really good one, too. And, uh... My, uh, Kelly used to tell me that when when she when she was young, you know, a little little blonde, blue eyed girl, you know, and she would when she'd get all pissed off about something, you know, she'd get all flustered as this little girl, and she would start yelling or something, throwing some kitty fit. He her father had the best best response to a to a, a flustered, pissed off kid. You just whisper, you go, why are you yelling? You know, because if you yell at them and say quiet which most parents do. I, I'm guilty of that sometimes too, you know, especially when your kids are screaming at, at two o'clock in the morning because they want to play. You know? <laughs> I said, go to bed! You know, his response is, why are you yelling? You know, and it's so freaking genius. So I try to do that with my kids. Yeah. But I kind of adopted my mother's attitude with kids. She's My mother always had a very relaxed attitude with kids and she, you know, she's a good parent, you know, she's really, she had, she had a really, you know, kids like her a lot, they, they, my kids tend to really, really, uh, take to my mom very quickly, because she's just got a very laid back attitude with them and stuff like that, and, you know, you know, if, for instance, you know, if I was to, not that I ever did, because I was a perfect kid, FYI, just, just so you know, you know, I never, uh, I never ever misbehaved as a kid, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, but, uh, you know, like if I was to be like at a grocery store or something like that and I wanted, I want my something, <laughs> throwing some fit or something like that, my mother would just sit there and wait, just sit and wait. My mother didn't, my mother doesn't embarrass. That's one thing you need to know about my mom. She doesn't embarrass at all. <laughs> so if I was like, I, I, I want my, I want my candy, I want you to love me. Throwing some big, huge hissy fit and screaming and throwing myself on the floor, which of course I'd never do. I'm, I'm only speaking hypothetically, of course, but, um, you know, she'd just sit there and wait, you know, or she, my mother's favorite line was throw a fit at him, you know, throw a fit. And I would throw a fit. And I would, you know, kick and scream and everything like that. And she'd just sit and wait. And then I'd keep screaming. And then eventually I'd tie her out and I'd follow her. And she'd reach out her hand and I'd take her hand and we'd continue walking down the aisle. And nobody gave a shit, you know. There was, there was, you know. <laughs> kids do what kids do sometimes. And you just, if you, if you get all embarrassed and, oh, stop that. I can't believe you're doing that. You're being a bad boy, you know, and all this, all this nonsense. They're just going to get more stressed out and act up more, you know. But if you don't, if you don't, you know, if you don't feed the flame, then they just tire out and realize, okay, well, this 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 trick doesn't work with mom, so you know, we'll try we'll try communicating instead, you know. I remember my my daughter Emily uh, when she was probably around four, four or five years old. 
em Emily never threw fits. She just wasn't a fitty type of kid, you know. She she didn't generally do that. She would get sad sometimes, get a bit emotional, but she never generally didn't throw fits. She was pretty calm that way. But one day she did. And at the time I was living in this cool kind of like artist loft. Really cool place. And uh, it's big open floors and stuff like that. And, you know, floor to ceiling windows. The, two, the ceilings were like 20 feet up in the air. And yes, in Montreal, you, as as a person who's not filthy rich, you can you can find great deals for places like that. I, I was, what I was paying, the rent I was paying there was a steal. But uh, in any case, uh, she just decides to throw this fit. And she, I, I can't remember why. She was just pissed off about something and she was, testing the water to see how, you know, see what she could get away with daddy, I guess. And I had this old brown rocking chair right in the middle of the floor. And she just started whacking her face on this chair. Whack, 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 you know. And, you know, my, my, my up, my, the way I was raised, you know, my mother's tactics kind of kicked in. She's really whacking and whack, you know, her hands on her face simultaneously. An adult technically can't do that because the limbs are too long and clumsy, but a kid can, you know. And she's just smacking her face full force on it. And it eventually, she ended up giving you a little cut on her lip. <laughs> she's bleeding, right? So she's got snot and tears and saliva, you know, from, uh, for, and, and a little bit of blood mixed in with that. So she had a nice little messy lip there. And I looked at she, she, she's screaming and she's crying and she's throwing a big fit and I just waited just sat there and watched her I sat next to her on the chair on the on the floor next to her when she was done I said you know you hurt your lip and she's like yeah my boo-boo on my lip and I said yeah I said why'd you get the boo-boo on your lip because I hit my face on this thing and it hurts and everything I said yeah okay you gonna do that again no I said, okay, and what are you going to do next time you get upset? I'll tell you. I said, ah, there's a big girl. And that was it. That was the last time she ever threw a fit. Of course, not all kids, not all kids are created equal. Some kids just have a hell of a lot more energy than other ones. And, you know, they get, they, they act up a little bit. They, they're, they're easier to, to excite. Right? You know, you look, you really, you know, all those parenting, I'm, I'm starting to talk about parenting. Why? I'm just talking about you know, stories, stories and thoughts because, well, I'm doing very repetitive mundane stuff here. But, uh, yeah, you know, when you have your first kid very often, you know, there's all these, you know, parenting magazines and all this garbage out there. And, uh, see all that noodling? I didn't even realize how much work I'd already done. But, uh, but yeah, there's all these parenting magazines, you know, 10 tips to have a calm toddler and all this bullshit. Excuse me for swearing, but, you know. There are little tip to, to future parents if you're thinking of having kids, and I'm sure every parent, everybody who's got kids will totally agree with what I'm about to say. You know, guides are nonsense because there are no two kids that are designed the same. I have three kids, right? I have a one-year-old, I have a four-year-old, a five-year-old. She just turned five a couple of days ago. Her birthday is a couple of days before mine, and uh, and a 13-year-old. So I've kind of seen a good wide spectrum, you know. Um, I haven't had a late teen or an adult yet, but uh, that's coming soon. But uh, there is zero similarity between all three of my kids. They all have a sense of humor. That's about the, that's about the closest thing. But they are completely different people, and you realize as a parent, you always, you know, you know, whenever you see kids that act up and stuff like that, and you say, ah, oh, the kid's like that because they got bad parents, they learn it from their parents. That's true sometimes, you know, certain bad behaviors and stresses do come from parents, but some kids just are the way they are. They're born that way, you know, they're born that way. And you can see that from a very early age, the type of personality, like my son, uh, Lucas, my one-year-old, is, uh, he's just like, He's just pure adrenaline, climbing on everything, you know, he's just, everything he does is fast. Even the way he was born was fast. He was, he came out like, we almost didn't make it to the hospital, came out so fast type of thing. You know, my wife almost gave birth to him in the car. Don't know if I've ever told that story before, but that was pretty epic, you know. But he's just climbing, running, getting into everything. That's my son. Chloe is super smart and super cutting. 
<laughs> she can outwit any adult, no problem. You know, I gotta take the whites down here a little bit. I think that's a little bit too hypercharged. Um, but uh, she's witty as hell. This girl, you know, like I have some serious competition with this with this little one, big time. Uh, no, that's not gonna work. Um, she's just extremely, extremely witty, and she can hold her own in an argument. Like you know, she's not improved. Adult, adult. Um, that didn't change anything, did it? I'll just take a, just take a brush over it then. Um, she'd act up or she was doing something or she wasn't listening or whatever the case might be and I'd, I'd, I'd snap at her and I'd say I said I said knock that off and she'd look at me and she said no you knock it off <laughs> I mean we're talking about a two-year-old she just stares me right between the eyes and says no you knock it off daddy I've had enough of this <laughs> and what do you do as a parent when you go like damn she just like I just sat there kind of like a little little kid going Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I wasn't expecting that response. You know, this little blue-eyed girl. You know, just looking at me, going, you know, you sit down and listen to me. You know, and I'm sitting there going, wow. And my, I didn't want to laugh in front of her because the last thing in the world I want to do as a parent is encourage her to talk to her daddy that way. That's pretty, pretty disrespectful. If you take it out of the cute context, it's not very. It's not very nice, right? But it was freaking funny. <laughs> so, this little, this little, little thing looking at me, basically telling dad what it's telling dad what it's gonna be. You know, this is this is how it's gonna be, dad. You know, and I had to turn around to laugh because I couldn't hold it back. <laughs> it was the funniest thing. It was the funniest thing I'd ever heard her do. And she does stuff like this all the time. You know, I remember the other day I was putting her to bed and. Uh, she, uh, I'm putting her down to bed and she's, um, she likes it. Like I always read her a story every night you know, when I put her to bed and stuff. And one night it was just too late. You know, we were up too late and stuff like that. And I said, no, pumpkin, we can't, uh, there's no story tonight. And she looks at me and she says, daddy, if you don't read me a story, I'm leaving. And I went, what? But she said it with that same kind of adult depth and authority. She wasn't she, 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 she wasn't being heavy with her language. She was speaking very matter-of-factly. Like, her, the tone of her voice was, you know what? I think I've, I think I've had enough of you. <laughs> you know? Again, this is at the time she was four when she said this, you know? Now she just turned five. But um, like I said, because I repeat myself a lot. But, um, you know, she just looks at me with this utmost authority and says, you know what, Daddy? If you, if you don't read me a story, I'm leaving. I've really had enough of this type of type of tone with me, and I just looked at her and I started to laugh. You know, like I can't believe the shit that comes out of this this girl's mouth. You know, out of the mouth of babes, as they say. It's just a total riot. Yeah. And then I have Emily, who's in terms of sense of humor, is probably the closest to me, because she's got that silliness about her. You know, she's she to me she's she's an artist in denial. You know, she sees how hard it can be to be an artist sometimes and, you know, make a living and all that kind of stuff. She says, I don't want to be an artist. It's like, yeah, but you're just pretty damn good at it, you know. But whatever. She can be whatever she wants when she gets older. But, you know, we have that, you know, we have that kind of silly humor side of us. That's fair. In terms of sense of humor, we're very similar in that sense. Yeah, it's starting to come together. As they say in French, c'est beau. That means that's nice. All right. Now, if I've learned anything from my uh, earlier videos, I'm not going to let this video run on for too long. I'm going to keep them in. I mean, you're not going to see the transitions, but there might be little pops in the middle of the video because if I record over 40 minutes, then it's then it lags the crap out of my system, and sometimes it can cause problems with Camtasia. So, yeah. When you count to three, we'll be starting a new part. All right, so here we are. Back to the next part. I was actually thinking uh, inspiration. Um, uh, kind of what 
fueled my inspiration for this type of piece, this kind of approach. And it's actually, um, inspiration doesn't necessarily have to come from one particular source. It can come from any source. Remember, as you paint, your your own voice is coming up, but at the same time, you're, there's very often artists you're going to be drawn to, right? The type of works you're going to be attracted to and stuff like that. And um, I can flatten that stuff. It's looking better. Um, and if I'm trying to, I was trying to think during the break, or at least my break, not your break, but I was trying to think during the break, um, uh, what type of artists contributed or what kind of works or games or whatever it was that kind of contributed to being inspired to paint something like this. And there's a few things actually, when I thought about it, um, not the first thing is actually a game that, uh, uh, my, myself and my daughter, Emily love, um, not only in terms of just the fun and fun gameplay, but, uh, just the beautiful artistry of this game and very unique. And it's not a mainstream game either. Um, uh, it's the game Machinarium. I don't know if you guys have ever checked it out, but if you don't, if you haven't, I really suggest you go and check, just, um, check it out. I'm going to link the, uh, a lot of the stuff I mentioned, I'm going to link in the, in my forum page when I, when I upload this video. Um, but, uh, Machinarium is, it's a game both, it's now for mobile as well. They have it for the iPhone as well, but, uh, it was originally a PC game. And it was designed, it was put together just by a few guys. I can't remember where from. I actually contacted them at one point. I never heard back from them probably because they didn't understand what I wrote them. <laughs> I was basically writing them to tell them that I love the work. But uh, um, um, it's the art style behind this game. Because it's done, it's, it's done entirely in Flash and 2D by the looks of it. But all the backgrounds are hand-painted. And there were a few, I think there was actually, if you check up out, check it out on YouTube, like Art of Machinarium or whatever like that, I think I remember, if I find it, I'll post it on my forum. It was um, uh, like just a guy kind of showing a quick demo of the different backgrounds they had painted, the artists who had painted it and stuff like that. And it's very unique. It's very steampunk for starters. Um, in terms of if you were to think about atmosphere and grit that I'm painting here, it's very inspired by that. Um, of course, the, their approach to the painting was much more uh, line art based, but uh, it was, um, it's just overlaying and overlaying and overlaying of, of textures of rust and brick and grit and dirt and you name it. It's just rich with detail and it, and Combined with the music, sound, I, I actually bought the soundtrack. I loved it. I loved it so much. Um, it's a very inspiring soundtrack. It has this very steampunk type soundtrack that goes with it as well. I really thought it was really, really cool. And you combine all of that when you're playing the game. It's got this amazing mood to it. It's the best way I could describe it. It's just this very moody game. And it's very simplistic. You're this little robot. And you're going on. It's, it's basically a puzzle game essentially but um uh it's it's just got this right off the bat as soon as you start the game it's just got this amazing mood to it and i was very inspired and i actually painted something a while back a long while back very differently than i did here it was actually trying to kind of emulate the style of that game a little bit in my piece uh, it was a critter critter collector something like that I, I don't even have a post-it anymore it's one of my older pieces i don't have it up on my portfolio but uh um really 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 love that game and that's definitely something that i'm that that plays into it because i enjoyed working with producing uh paintings that had that very dirty rusty polluted you know a slapped a, a city that was slapped together with slabs of metal you know just like rusty slabs of metal it's kind of like a a constant work in progress city type of thing kind of like this you know um, I like that. I always love that concept. And if I think of other artists that inspired me, so that was definitely played a big part. Um, oh yes. Another one I'm going to, uh, I've mentioned him in my earlier videos too. Uh, Marco Bucci had, uh, um, ha has his own YouTube channel as well. And there's one painting in particular. I'm kind of, I'm, I haven't seen it in a long time, but I'm kind of referencing my memory a little bit in this painting. Uh, I'm sure when I look at the actual painting itself, it's going to look quite different than this. But um, uh, it was a painting that kind of, when you watched, if you when you saw the beginning of this painting, how the whole thing started, 
it's very um, it's very much inspired by what I remember of his work, and it was very loose and. I, I, there was kind of a mantra I kept playing in my head while I was painting it out was to, he was describing how when he's painting like that, especially, in fact, when he paints generally, this is kind of more indicative of his quote unquote style, um, is um, he would um, keep himself in the quote unquote block in phase. He would work very quickly and very loosely and go really crazy with color and all that kind of stuff, slap in a couple of textures maybe, start with a very loose block in, um, which uh, there's art, a lot of artists that actually enjoy working that way. And uh, it's, a, it's a very popular way to work. I enjoy it too. Um, so you keep yourself in the block in phase. So as soon as you start to feel like your, your mind's starting to tighten up and you're starting to get into detail, you stop, you know? You don't allow yourself to get that way. And the entire time I've been painting this painting, I've been constantly keeping myself in that block and phase. I'm not sitting going, going, oh, you know, there's just some kind of rough lines. It's kind of, uh, could use some, no, 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 no. Don't let yourself think that way. Just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. You know, keep yourself in a very, just build up this depth and detail and, and roughness and energy to your piece and, and don't let yourself get caught down. The power of this piece isn't in the refinement and the, the rendering of these materials. You notice there's little to none of that. I'm just slapping in things very, very quickly. Um, and you just ask yourself, does it feel right? Does it feel right? If it feels right, leave it, move on, you know, and just keep building and adding to it. And that's how you can produce a painting that's, as you can see here, there's a lot of information going on. And it's the information, it's that depth of the piece that actually gives it its power, gives it its strength. If I start coming in and rendering out these specularity and, you know, coming in and getting super tight with it, then it's going to lose that energy, you know. So this is very much an energy inspired piece. And, and Again, like I mentioned, it's very much inspired by the works of uh, Marco Bucci. If you check out his work, you'll immediately see the connection between what I'm doing here and his work. You know, even these kind of like little kind of like uh, this little city with these little lights is an idea that it, that I that I grabbed from one of his paintings as well. I really liked how he did that. It gave it a nice sense of mood. In fact, I find it's these little elements that are actually adding the most mood to it. But of course. I start that way. I kind of looked at it and I went, okay, cool. I want to, I want to start that way, but then, um, I take it off in my own direction. I, I, I take off with that idea and I allow that, I allow my own brain to take over at that point. And that's how I personalize the work. Right. But how I started, it was very much inspired by his works. So I definitely suggest you go check it out. Like I said, if you want to, if you want to go and check out the video, uh, and he's a great teacher too. He really knows how to explain things too. He's another guy that I praise for his teaching skills, um, in my own little head here, you know, but, uh, he's a teacher in real life and, uh, and he knows how to explain things really nicely. And what I strongly recommend you, one of the reasons I recommend his work to people a lot is because of his color. He's fabulous with color. He's very carefree with it. And um, it, it's very inspiring when you're working with color. If you really want to learn how to use color well, check out his videos because he's um, he understands the whole principle of being very... He describes it as there's no such thing as right or wrong color. The more loose you are with color, the more brave you are with color, the more interesting your piece is. A lot of people try to, you know, find, you know, they, they, you have to get into an abstract headspace when you're working with color. That's extremely important. You can't sit there and think of things too literally, or you can ruin a very strong concept. You can tighten things up in a way that, that, that kind of kills the energy of your piece. And color is energy, essentially, right? So it's very important to, to always be conscious of that. And checking out his videos, he'll be he'll do a very nice job of explaining it for you. So just go check it out. If you're not sure where the forum is, if you're on my page, AdamDuff.com, and just scroll down to the bottom, and you'll see the forum. If you if you can't find it, if it's if like when the videos add up and stuff like that, because that's kind of how I planned out this site, is that it's kind of open-ended tutorials. So if you want to add to content or build our content, I can always update with new videos. But um, 
if you want to if you want to find the form quickly, just scroll up to the top, and I, I always have a big red button at the top that uh, um, that'll send you straight to the form. So just go up to the top and then hit that big red button, and it'll send you right down to the bottom. Every now and then, uh, my keyboard shortcuts just stop working, and I learned through ex this was this was a problem that originally with that, that that threw me off for a long time. You know, like I would sit there, like I remember the first time this happened to me, all of a sudden my keyboard shortcuts just didn't work. My like I would try and just try to change my brush size and it wouldn't work. It's like what the hell? And I spent like half a day trying to figure out what the hell it was. And I'm, you go on forums, of course, half the forums out there, you know, you know, you, you tell them, you know, you. You, see, you read the post, the the forum post, and it says, "Yeah, my brushes aren't just stopped working and everything, and blah blah blah." And then you you know you get one guy and says, "Well, you know, one troll is going to come on and say, well, learn how to use Photoshop." You know, if you can't, if you don't know how to change your brush size, you probably shouldn't be on Photoshop. And then of course the technicians come on, and they're no help either because they say, "Give me the specs. You know, what are your what are the tech specs of your computer?" You know, so you have to go out and. You know, send them your tech specs, and then then you have to wait three days to get a response from them. Type of idea, you know. So I'm not big on forums when it comes to learning stuff. And and I figured out what the problem was. Uh, is that I I uh, I mean I work and live in Montreal, so I have a bilingual keyboard. I can flip it back and forth between French and English. And anybody who has a keyboard, if you use if you write in more than one language and you have more than one language set up on your on your for your keyboard. I don't know what it is that I keep doing, but you know, I've been doing this for years. But you, some some button combination will flip my keyboard from English to French, and all of a sudden my keyboard shortcuts don't respond, and and I would get so frustrated. Now every time my now I know from experience if my keep, every once in a while it happens about three or four times during a painting my keyboard shortcuts just stop working. I just look over at my action bar, switch it back over to English, and then everything's fine again. But man, was that a frustration when it first happened to me. Jesus, I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. Of course, you know, I was on forums and trying to figure it out, and it was just a big headache, and of course the forums were sending me in 2,000 different directions, and you know, I was ready to reinstall my operating system, for God's sakes, you know, because I thought I had some kind of virus. It wasn't that at all. It's just my language setting. It was just switching a button from English to, to from French to English, and then it was all fixed. So if you ever run into that problem, first ask yourself, you know, do you have a Russian English keyboard? Do you have a French English keyboard? Do you have a German English keyboard? You know, if you write anybody, you know, because now in the online community, a lot of the people, a lot of you guys watching it are probably from a different country, speak a different language. Maybe you're from Brazil or from Spain or from. Africa, you never know. I, there's a lot of people that check this stuff out, so it could be you have a bilingual keyboard, so or a trilingual keyboard. Ooh, that would be hell, wouldn't it? Oh gosh, the thought of that just scares me. Yeah, I gotta say that noodling. Talking, narrating your own videos is an awesome practice when it comes to noodling. Because <laughs> I'm totally just kind of in this chill headspace and just painting away and adding little details here and there. And it's I'm moving forward very quickly with my pace because of it. I'm going to add a little bit of smoke to those stacks. I picked up an. Oh, here's something else I can mention. I'll send you, I'll give you guys a link on my form for that too. Um, is. Um, I got a bunch of brand new brushes and an awesome brand new tutorial. Uh, the, these brushes I actually got from um, uh, Dave Raposa's new video, uh, Bog Witch. It's really good. It's worth checking out. I'll put a link in my thing so you can go and check it out if you want to pick it up. It's, it's, it's freaking amazing. He's like the video. It's it's his Gumroad page, you know, and uh, he's got like. Uh, he put out a video now. It's like eight hours or something like that for five bucks. I was like, Jesus, man. You know, a guy like Dave Raposa can can afford that because he's got so many freaking fans that you know he, he'll make a he'll make a handsome penny off of five dollar videos because a lot of, he's got a huge following. So, mm, yeah, I want to keep it lighter, but I don't want it to compete too much with this moon. 
So I am going to move my moon over, my little baby moon. Just want to create any tangents with this thing over here. Just so it's not, uh, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want it to conflict with the smokestacks. This is going to flatten things out a little bit. I don't want that. There we go. That's a bit better. I'll take the opacity down a little bit. Yeah, but he, uh, with Dave Repose's video, with his Bog Witch videos, he also has a brush set, and there's a lot of good, a lot of good brushes. I mean, I've been collecting brushes for such a long time, and I'm, you know, uh, and it's fun when I can do a painting like this because it really gives me an opportunity to really uh, uh, play around with a lot of them. Because a lot of them, very often, I'll, you know, if you've seen my King's Harem tutorials or you know my Demons ones that I just put out recently, they're all done with the same. Like I use this brush that I'm using right now. For you know, for all of my characters, I used it for. The, I very often pick one brush that has a certain type of feel and texture to it, and I'll use that one brush for the entire thing. King's Harem, I had one brush that I loved for that thing, and I did an entire six-month painting using one brush. Everything, everything you see was all one brush. Um, but in this particular case, I made a deliberate point of playing with lots of brushes, just nerding out and having fun with them. So we need a few more little smokestacks here. But I don't want to see, like, I would, if I'm thinking just in terms of composition, I wouldn't add smoke to these pipes coming out here in the back. Why? Because I would have an overlap with these two, and it creates a bit, a little bit too much congestion. So I might add a little bit of smoke here, have some smoke coming out of these guys over here, because I could use that visual information, right, in this area. But here I don't want to over congest it. There's a little bit too much, so I want to keep my, if I'm thinking of my painting in terms of silhouette, right? I've got a nice silhouette going on here, but if I start packing in too much, I'm going to start cross-hatching all my silhouette. I'm going to cross-hatch my silhouette, and that kills the clarity of it. I want to be able to, to, I want it to read from a distance, right? So it's important. You always want it to read from a distance. So here, this area could use a little bit more attention, but this area is starting to feel pretty, pretty, I'm comfortable with the amount of information there. I don't want to push it too much further, so I'm going to add a little bit of smoke to these areas too. This this is a new smoke brush I got. It was this, a standard smoke brush I was using for a little while. And if you think about smoke, how smoke behaves, right? Um, it generally it's thicker and more billowy at the beginning, and then it softens and kind of the particles disperse as they as they travel away, right? The air they kind of get blown around and stuff like that. So I'm not just going to create a perfect smoke stack like this. That's more like cigarette smoke because cigarette smoke doesn't travel that far, right? But here, I would. You notice I'm, I'm as I travel further, I start very tight with a little tight brush, and then I fan it out and make it lighter, and my touch gets a little bit lighter as I travel out. So whenever you're painting smoke or stuff like that, any kind of atmospheric effect, be it fog or smoke or any of these things. Uh, you have to think about the properties and behavior of these different types of particles. A uh, very good example of this was uh, years ago, before uh, Bobby Chu started his, um, it was probably during the times he was do he first started doing his Chu stream, it was before he started Schoolism, but um, uh, he had one, oh, it actually wasn't, a video tutorial. It was in an Imagine Effects book, you know, one of their, their annual issues and stuff like that. And he had a tutorial. He was describing how he did um, his painting of like the cowboys on horseback walking towards the camera type of piece. I love that piece. And uh, he was describing. He was in it uh, in in the article that came with it. He was uh, describing how uh, how to uh, take whenever you're painting uh, uh, any kind of atmospheric effect, you always have to think of the properties. Like a heavy, humid fog, there's more weight to it, so more it'll have more of a tendency to billow and sit heavy on the ground, and it'll have a tendency to kind of disperse. Here, you see, I'm creating a bit of a tension here, so I'm going to take my airbrush and kind of clean it. Oh. 
right. When my phone rang, it was my sister calling me to wish me a happy birthday. My crazy sister. She's a bit of a nut. But that was pretty cool. So I said, you know, I'll screw it. I'm already at the hour mark, so I might as well uh, just start a new video at that point. So welcome to the next part. Part something, because I'm not keeping track. Uh, yeah, so where are we? Now I'm just trying to, what I'm also doing, just to give you an idea of where my headspace is in terms of this, I'm, I am thinking about detail, you know. Uh, making this an exciting piece of artwork where there's a lot of you know a lot of stuff to check out and enjoy um, but also I'm also thinking about not making it too redundant um, I like to kind of break it up and throw things here and throw things there to kind of break the break the repetitive nature of it um, and at the same time create a sense of balance and one way of thinking of balance is I have a lot this is a very diagonal emphasis there's a lot of diagonal emphasis in this painting a lot of diagonal lines to give it energy and movement you notice at the very beginning I kind of tilted my entire composition over to the side which causes my painting here if I'm going to draw some lines for you it causes my painting to lean over in one direction okay now you'll notice when I tilt it over my composition I have one diagonal line going this way. So I think of like think of it as lines leading in one direction and weighing over on the other direction as well, right? It's compositional weight essentially. So I ha so it, when you do that, you have to counterbalance that weight so that your eye just doesn't go right off the canvas, right? So what you do is you throw in opposing lines, opposing weight in the opposite direction to help balance it, right? So I'm going to have structures pointing in one direction. I'm going to need some pointing in the other direction as well. It might be necessary, come to think of it, to add some kind of a counterweight here as well. I might, I'm thinking about doing something like, how would I do that? Well, I might be able to add a big smokestack coming off of this house over here, perhaps. Something to counter that weight so that the balance works. And if I flip this horizontally, you can very often get a better idea. Uh, Another way I could do this, because it looks like I could use a lot of weight in the other direction, I could take this pipe, something in the foreground, and I could have a pipe that just cuts right across like this, okay? And that creates an opposing opposing line to help balance out the composition. In, with this building here, instead of having this building pointing in the same direction as this one, I might just select it and tilt it in the other direction, and that can create some a back and forth balance. Uh, that's something that works a little bit more for this particular kind of piece because it's got a quirky nature to it right it's not uh, it's got a very cartoony influence to the type to the style to it so I can get away with having buildings tilting in wacky directions right I can flatten that now let's try something here I'm gonna take this uh, actually no because I let's undo those smokestacks because that's just gonna give me more uh, hmm no, I'll worry about that after. It's not that important. I just want to keep working on adding some information to this. But you can see like how you, how my brain is thinking in terms of weight, right? I'm a lot leaning in one direction. I want to lean in the other direction. The other thing I have here is in terms of composition, I have this kind of circular design that works its way around the clock tower, right? I'm going to want to keep emphasizing that, so I might want to create a structure that leads my eye around here to create this circle, circular composition that leads our, our eye to the focal point, which is right here, right? Or right here, because it's the highest level of contrast in this area, right? But it's creating a circular kind of tunnel effect that pulls your eye towards the middle, okay? Um, so that's kind of where my head's thinking in terms of composition. So what can I do? I can extend this building out a little bit bridge it in a little bit and maybe add a little bit of some kind of structure up here at the top that pulls our eye back in like that maybe have a pipe sticking out that curves right to suggest that curved shape maybe even have that pipe curve around like this or follow that kind of curved suggestion we can play with that again when I start to get too tight, I get too anal with my work, I remind myself, no, loosen up. Listen to Marco, he knows what he was talking about. Stay in that blocking, blocking headspace. It's very liberating working this way. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it.
Yeah, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. You know, in our culture, our tendency is to uh, stick up for the little guy, which I do, by the way. I do believe in, you know, sticking up for the underdog. I don't like seeing people, I don't like seeing anybody singled out or bullied on or, you know, or any of those things. But I also don't like seeing the big guy get bullied either because big, one of the things that's happening with the online with a lot of online forums and stuff like that is it gives people the opportunity to pick on the big guy for whatever reason you know maybe they got bullied when they were younger or they got picked on or you know or they have a real aversion to the to the clicky popular crowd you know what not all big people are bad people some of them have big hearts on them so you can't go and hit on people like that all the time you know if they're authentic jerks you know you can tell them they're not being nice, but you don't have to be overly cruel with your correct. You remember, you're not their parent. You're just their their fan or their follower, or you know, you're or just a member of their forums or whatever the case might be. You don't hate on these people. You know, like they say, sometimes being on top is the loneliest place of all, and there's a lot of truth to that. You know, when you're you know, a, a junior artist or a senior artist working in the industry and stuff like that. And, you know, when you have a hard time with something, so you're struggling with something or you want to learn something, or whatever the case might be, you get a little bit of, you, you, people are a little bit more relaxed. They're a little bit more lenient with you. They'll, they'll offer you advice. They'll stick up for you. They'll do kind of, they'll do that, you know, but with boss, with your boss, for instance, confided your boss isn't an asshole. He's an asshole, then fuck him. But um, confided, your 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 boss is a nice guy, you know. How many bosses do you know? How many employees do you know that walk into a boss's office and say, "Is everything going? Everything all right?" You know, you look like you're going through a little bit of stress. Of course, a lot of bosses try to maintain that tough exterior. You know, and say, "I'm fine, thank you. It's very kind of you. Now get back to work." You know. <laughs> Because there's that whole stigma about how bosses are supposed to be tough and handle a lot of shit. And yeah, they are. There is a lot of, there's truth to that, you know. There's there's a resilience. You have to develop a bit of a, a bit of a thick skin to be able to handle certain stresses because there's a lot of weight that comes with it. Because remember, if you're an artist, if you're a junior or a senior artist and things don't work out like you're working on a project and the client or whoever you're working with doesn't doesn't like the work whose job is on the line yours or the boss's right now in the case that there's you know you're an artist and you you know you you haven't quite adapted to uh to working in a professional studio and stuff like that which by the way is totally normal right uh, it doesn't mean you suck and it doesn't mean your career is finished. You, you might get sacked from a job. I've been sacked from jobs too, you know, because I wasn't good enough yet. And that's totally a part of it. Um, you know, if there's one artist that's slacking off and holding everybody back, yeah, well then you blame the artist because they're not, they're not putting their part in, you know, or they haven't learned the discipline of, you know, working for a team. They're thinking too much about their, you know, their going home to the girlfriend and, smooching with her or something like that you know or they they bring too much of their personal life into into the workplace and stuff that's that kind of stuff's normal but that happens you know but when a boss has a hard day they can't sit around and go you know what i don't feel like this anymore i'm having a shitty day you know you can't do that a boss would get fired in two seconds for for letting their shitty day you know of talking about their shitty day to their staff they have to keep a tough lip to keep a tough upper lip and keep moving and when they are, have, if, if the shit does hit the fan and a production doesn't work, who loses the job? The boss does. Because they're the ones who, with, with the money and the, you know, with the, with the salary that you're getting and the recognition and the quote unquote title, which by the way, doesn't really mean squat unless you love your job, you know, having a big title does not mean squat, um, comes accountability. And that's one of the big things about being in a leadership position. You're accountable for what's going on. And what is it? A, a boss will look out for their artists, a good boss. Of course, I'm, assume that I'm talking about good bosses, you know, a good boss or director will look out for their artists and say, OK, I can see you're having a hard time. I've had some really cool bosses, you know, my one of my old directors uh, um, who's not surprisingly doing extremely well, you know, has, <laughs> has done extremely well for himself because uh, he's such a freaking awesome guy all around, you know. 
I had I was going through a bit of a rough time at one point and one of my boss I, but I didn't let it leak into my work you know I kept working I kept doing my thing and everything like that knowing that there was a lot of heavy stuff going on in my life around me and everything like that there's a lot of stresses going on and he recognized that there was something going on in me maybe he just saw that I wasn't being my normal self you know um, and uh, he, he took me into his office one day if you're listening, you know who you are. I'm not going to name names because he's got a very, you know, he's, he's very big in the industry now, you know. And he took me into his office and he says, how are you doing, Adam? And I said, I'm doing good. I'm doing great. And he goes, okay, stop bullshitting me. You know, what's going on? <laughs> and I went, oh, you know, I'm having, a, you know, there's some, I'm having a bit of a hard time here or there and blah, blah, blah. But no, it's, it's not affecting my work. And he goes, no, I know it's not affecting your work, but do you need a break? And I went, what? You do need a break. And I said, uh, oh, I'm not going to just abandon the project. We're right in the middle of something. And it was a big project, too. We were working on a, um, we we're working on something big, you know. And he said, uh, do you need a week off? Do you need two? Do you need a month off? And I went, uh, I didn't know what to say. You know, nobody had ever offered that to me before. You know, I, didn't, I never expected that to come my way, you know. He goes, Adam, if you need a month off, take a month off. And I said, well... I'll tell you what, I'll, why don't I take a couple of days off and if I need a little bit more time, I'll take it. But, you know, the very fact to me, the very fact that he was willing to offer me a month off, I didn't want to take time off. I, it made me a more caring employee artist, you know, for his team. And it was a, it was a, a really eye-opening experience for me you know he was such a decent guy to offer me that he was really willing to and I, I was playing a, I played a very important role in the project that we were working on I was directing it you know and I said seriously man if you're willing to do something like that for me um, even though it's not affecting our work I could understand it would make sense if he could see that I was just burning out and freaking out and all that kind of stuff and I and, and the quality of my work suffered. my quality of my work wasn't suffering at all I'm good at disconnecting, you know, professional dis disconnection, professional disassociation. I'm good at that, you know. You you learn to after time, you know. It's not it's something. It's just a skill that I developed through, you know, having to deal with living a norm, living a, a real human life and having work to do at the same time. And the very fact that he did that, I took two days off. I relaxed. I came back full force. And he said, Adam, you can take more time off if you need it. I was like, No, if I need it, I'll let you know. But you know, unless I'm really in dire need, then, then I'm there for you. And I became his, I became a much more supportive figure in, in that team, even though I was already a director, you know, it pushed me into an even more supportive role to him. It made me care for the company. It made me care a lot more on a personal level for the company, you know, and that was, when I saw that, I, the, I immediately told myself, you know what, if I ever have his position, he's my role model that's how i want to treat my staff you know i want to be there for people treating people like humans treating treating people like you know with decency and it was proof to me that that whole you know gestapo type of attitude you know you have a quota meet it if you don't meet it you're fired that kind of shit that doesn't work for me that's not the kind of boss i am you know um i do you know we have a production to work with but I, I, to me, don't believe that being a boss means you have to be a, 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 a hardcore douchebag. That's a choice, you know. Some people work well with hardcore douchebags because they need somebody to give them a little extra kick in the pants whenever they need to get the job done. That's cool. Not me, you know. And I really, re I really respect that type of an environment. And needless to say, the company that he's running right now um, is doing extremely well. And, you know. I'm so freaking happy for him. Now, he's a big guy. He's a big, he's a high roller, this guy. He's, he's pretty much on top when it comes to hierarchy in a company, in a very, very reputable company, you know? And I care for him personally. I don't care for him as, yeah, he's a good boss. No, he's a good guy. <laughs> he's a nice guy and he deserves a team that looks out for him. And looks out for his best interest and the best interest of the company because he cares. He really actually cares and gives a shit, 
you know, when you have a boss that's kind of like, you know, who treats you like you're another number, which I've been treated like, or just demoralizes you to, to get you to work harder, makes you feel like you're less of an artist because they're trying to push you harder and all that kind of crap. Fuck them. You know, uh, who, who's going to, who's going to, you'll work to pay your bills, but as soon as a better opportunity comes up, you'll get up and you'll leave. And that's just the end of it. You know, whether you say so when you're working in the company or not, probably not a good practice to tell your boss that as soon as I get an opportunity, I'm out the door. Well, you'll probably get sacked on the spot, but you know what I mean? You know, when it comes to a boss like that, I, you know, there, you don't have any emotional loyalty to a company like that. But when you have a boss that actually gives a shit and is willing to go out of your way, it doesn't mean every boss you ever know is going to give you a month off of, offer you a month off of work, but just to know that there's good people out there, you know? So don't be so hard on the big guys too, because you're, they're usually the ones in the loneliest position. And if, you know, if you've got a good boss who cares about his staff and he says, listen, I could really use your help if you could stay in a little bit later, you know, and you want to go home and, you know, play the new Warlords of Draenor expansion and you, so, you don't want to be inconvenienced with it. You know what? Inconvenience yourself for this guy because he would do, he's been doing it for you, you know, or she's been doing it. I'm singling out guys. I don't mean to be sound sexist, but your boss is has done it for you on a daily basis. When you go home and you make dinner, they're still sitting in the office when the janitor's walking around, you know, and vacuuming the floors and all the lights are out. They're still toiling away trying to get this stuff working. And they're not only worried about you, but they're also worried about everybody in the in the thing. So if your boss turns to you and says, you know, you know, you, would you mind working a little a couple of extra hours just to get this thing out? You know, you don't go, oh, man, seriously, I've been working for, uh, you know, man, just say, you bet, I'm, I've got your back. And you, you you spend it, you stay there a couple of extra hours for a couple of nights or so to, to help them out. You know, if you've got kids to pick up, that's a different story, you know, but you know what I mean? You got to stick up for your boss, too, because because uh, that's what makes a good company. That's what makes a company tick and what makes things move forward, you know. And like they say, like the expression goes, if the head of the fish stinks, you throw out the fish. Or like Jewish people would say, if the head of the fish stinks, they never finish the sentence. They let you finish it for you. If the head of the fish stinks, I'm just saying, okay. But, you know, if the head of the fish stinks, then the comp it reflects in the morale of the company, you know. But if you got a good boss, and if you can stick up for your boss and not just stick up for, you know, the more junior artists and stuff like that, then that's to me what really makes for a, a good working environment. You know, it becomes a real team effort. And when, when you do accomplish things together, you really have accomplished something. And the friends I've made in this company, my colleagues, not only my boss, but my colleagues, fellow artists and stuff like that in my team, they were, uh, they're still my very close friends to this day. It was that whole, that whole, good vibe that whole very family-like vibe really really translated through to long-term relationships you know and we still collaborate on projects together and stuff and, and you know we still get together regularly for what they call in quebec the cinq à sept which means five to sevens you know like an after hours after hours get together grab a couple of beers yeah we still get together for stuff like that And that to me is awesome. I love that. A lot of people, you know, like very often people are attracted to larger companies, right? They think a bigger company, the better. No, that's not true at all. Popularity, you know, popularity of a company, how the type of projects they've done does not reflect, does not necessarily mean that the company is a good company to work for. You know, the novelty of a big company wears off. There's certain big companies that are fantastic and they treat their employees like gold, you know. But there's other ones that treat their employees like absolute garbage. And, you you know, you really are treated like another number. You're employee 72258, you know, and you can feel that. Bigger company doesn't mean better. In fact, I very often, some of my best jobs that I enjoyed um, were for small companies. You know, little tight teams because... One of, the one of the big advantages, something to consider in your career as well, one of the big advantages for working for a smaller studio, very often, is the fact that you have more, uh, you have more to contribute to the company, right? A large company, very often you're pigeonholed into a role, 
a specific role, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, you know. And generally, large companies do pay better. They pay a little bit better. Actually, no, that light's coming from the wrong direction, um, which is something to take into account, you know. And if you can find some stability and happiness in that job, awesome. Uh, but in a small studio, when it comes to gaining experience, like overall experience, um, that you can apply towards your the future of your career. Very often, small studios are a very good thing to consider. Um, that's how I got my break into artistic direction, because I was originally working for, I was working for a smaller company, that particular company that I'm talking about, and I'm sure all my friends that are, you know, that are listening to this that worked with me know exactly. They're probably smiling as I'm saying this because they probably agree with me. Yeah, but uh, you know. I, you, I started off as a senior artist and then got quickly bumped up into a director position. And it was that chance that gave me the opportunity to learn how to direct. And uh, from there, I moved on to directing for larger companies and doing other things. But a lot of opportunity can be found in smaller companies. And you, you also forge relationships very often that are um, very long term, you know, like relationships that are very close because you kind of. You weren't just the guy who had to deal with the shit that was dealt with you. You were part of it. Like when we'd have meetings, we'd have, you know, my friend Jimmy likes to coin the expression bitch and slurps, you know, we'll get together every now and then and uh, we'll just sit and bitch about life or talk about whatever. We get into these long conversations about stuff. We do it regularly and we'd have our, our weekly bitch and slurps together where people can sit, we sat down and we were like, we were close enough where, you know, my, 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 my. The, the artists that I was directing, you know, they could be very candid and open with me and just say it like it is, respectively, of course, you know, they didn't cross any lines of respect, but, you know, it was a really, really pleasant working environment. I really enjoyed that. Oh, how's that in terms of value? Let me just do a little value check before I flatten anything. That's good. Yeah, that's fine. That works. Okay, I just want to make sure that moon doesn't cause any conflict. I'm going to add a little bit more contrast to the... Uh, if I can flatten that. I'm going to add a little bit more contrast to this thing here, to the structure, that circular structure. Just a little bit. Just create a little bit of simultaneous contrast here to help it pop a little bit better. All right. Seems how, um, you know, I don't want to milk a subject to death when it comes to talking about it. I thought it might be nice to take a little break from listening to me shoot my mouth off. Uh, so I'll put some nice ambient music, some mood music to get us in the mood for the steampunk painting. And uh, and that's it, all right. So enjoy the rest of the, the tutorial. <laughs> 